Every piece of media that falls under the death game genre faces the same problem. How to create a compelling enough motive that would drive a group of otherwise perfectly ordinary civilians to murder and commit other extreme acts of violence. The motives themselves often falling under familiar tropes. Some will risk the safety of the entire group in the event that none of their number are harmed, like in Battle Royale, where a group of high school students are equipped with explosive collars that will all automatically detonate if more than 24 hours pass without a student being killed. Some will endanger the group members' friends and family members, like in The Hunger Games, where tributes entire towns are endangered in the event they fail to play the games properly. Others will present extremely powerful financial incentives, such as in The Running Man, where partaking in a violent game show where contestants are essentially hunted for sport is one of the few means of amassing money in a world that hinders the lower class at every possible opportunity. But very few pieces of death game media, if any, take the approach that Fear and Hunger Termina does with failure to participate in the game fundamentally altering our protagonists to a state where many will eagerly do so. This transformative process is referred to in-game as moon scorching, and remains to me the most unique approach to this genre I've ever seen, in large part due to the fact that transformations that occur are unique to the characters that experience them. Although what exactly the moon scorch consists of can vary drastically character to character, they are typically crude amalgamations of whatever the characters consider to be their worst traits, or reflections of their deepest traumas, which is a big part of why I love this as a mechanic. It doesn't just make for intriguing, fun gameplay, but it provides crucial context as to why certain characters are the way they are. So, without further ado, let's take a look at each Moon Scorched form. Before we begin though, allow me to more thoroughly explain what exactly Moon Scorching is and its role in the aforementioned death game. Fear and Hunger Termina follows a group of 14 characters that are forced against their will to participate in an event known as the Festival of Termina, a battle royale type event in which only one character theoretically can live. The Festival of Termina isn't orchestrated by a corrupt dystopian government or legion of bored sadistic billionaires, but rather an eldritch ancient deity known as Rare. While Rare is a trickster god, he is heavily associated with truth, given the fact that moonlight illuminates what is shrouded in darkness. Moon scorching occurs whenever Rare stares too long upon an individual, the idea being he brings their true forms to light by forcing them to shed the shell, in this instance a human body, that shrouded them previously, reflecting the truth of their character as monstrous and often abominable. However, it's worth noting that truth in this instance needs to be taken with a grain of salt, as Rare notably detests humanity and claims the truth lurking within every human being is monstrous in order to justify this belief. It's important to bear in mind that just because a character expresses certain qualities within their moon scorch form doesn't mean that this is the reality of who they are. It just means this is the reality of what they fear they are. Despite this being the general trend though, there are two characters, Karen and Caligura, who don't quite exhibit the same shame and self-awareness the other 12 tributes do in regards to their own faults, and whose moon scorched forms therefore do reflect their realities. So before we begin to look at the others, let's take a look at these two notable exceptions. Karen is a war journalist that clearly wants badly to be perceived as heroic and valiant, describing herself as being akin to a Valkyrie that immortalizes the stories of the dead by carrying them on her back. Traditional Valkyries are honorable, guiding the souls of the departed to Valhalla, but that incredible, noble image is the furthest thing from how Karen is actually perceived. While she enters her profession with pure intentions, likely desiring to emulate the qualities of the traditional Valkyrie, as Karen advances in her career, she finds herself faced with the predicament of profiting off of suffering that is not hers to benefit from, her success being tied into catastrophic human suffering, the likes of which she has never come even remotely close to experiencing. Resultantly, to the townsfolk, she is viewed as simply a harpy that scavenges, picks through, and profits off of people's deepest pains, all while attempting to masquerade as a benevolent, charitable being. Caligura, on the other hand, seems fully aware of his worst qualities. He simply doesn't care. He is one of the only characters that will actively attempt to kill other contestants, being a mobster, and is openly hostile in practically every interaction. Prior to the Termina Festival, he was so well known for his cruelty he was heralded as Count Drago by his peers, and on top of this cruelty, he's rapidly established in-game as a predator. Caligura's moon-scorched form is therefore entitled rather effectively the Monster, a creature that cannot be shown for fear of my YouTube overlords, but that happens to strongly resemble Bo's father from Bo is Afraid. If you know, you know. His form is arguably one of the most disgusting in-game, with him being a literal sewer creature swamped with slime and mucus that spews poison from his mouth, both in a literal and metaphorical sense, in reflection of his perversion and cruelty. Then we have a handful of characters whose moon-scorched forms reflect their worst qualities, but are considered by the characters themselves to be the idealized versions of them. In this category, we have Tanaka, Samari, and Henrik. 
Tanaka is a Japanese businessman who has been groomed to become the sole heir to his family's corporate empire his entire life. In order to best prepare him for this role, his family, but his father specifically, places tremendous focus on teaching him to be entirely self-reliant, on how to maximize productivity at any and all costs, and discouraging him from displaying any signs of softness or weakness from a fairly early age. Yet there appears to be a constant conflict between Tanaka's natural personality and the idea that he ought best to seek and prioritize his own interests. Because in-game, there are numerous examples of Tanaka acting in a kind, altruistic fashion. He retrieves Olivia's wheelchair and will attempt to help you, the player, should you fall down the woodsman's well. But any potential altruism Tanaka displays is at odds with how his father believes he best ought to conduct himself. Tanaka's moon-scorched form is therefore heavily shaped by the guilt he feels at having potentially disappointed his father and family, being among the only moon-scorched forms that can vividly recall its own past. His form is simply entitled The Judgment, being a twisted, corrupted take on the accomplishment of shattering the glass ceiling. The form resembles Tanaka, but its body is littered with large, painful shards of glass as its neck is constrained by an object that, in my eyes, resembles a medieval torture device reflective of the immense pressure that has defined his life thus far. Somewhat ironically, the judgment even outright expresses remorse at having been too reliant on others to the point that it seemingly lacks any sense of self-preservation, constantly striving for productivity in spite of its deep injuries. This is yet another form whose dialogue stands out, with the judgment constantly repeating phrases that you could easily imagine he'd likely heard from his father thousands of times. Morning waits for no one. Morning has golden store in its mouth. The grind never stops. The world doesn't wait still as the weak loiter around. The judgment is clearly a reflection of the being Tanaka's father most wanted him to become, but interestingly enough is one Tanaka seems to recognize as being harmful to him. But specifically because this form mitigates the guilt he feels at having potentially disappointed his family, it's now ideal. Henrik, on the other hand, doesn't seem to have any sort of negative feelings tied into his moon scorch, seeming to perceive it as a desirable ideal. It's one of the only moon scorched forms whose name has a positive connotation being referred to as the Gentleman. The Gentleman is the only Moonscorch that isn't overtly aggressive, being capable of holding complex, fluid conversation. Although he boasts a trigger hair temper that can be easily brought out via one incorrect dialogue choice, he treats the player with at least a facade of courtesy, retaining many of the mannerisms that Henrik likely associates with higher society. Now, taking a look at Henrik's backstory in context of this form, we know that Henrik formally has struggled to establish himself professionally, with him working a service position. Reading his mind reveals that all he aspires to be is well-regarded and well-liked, with the gentleman being a bizarre embodiment of this desire, being cultured and refined in a way Henrik simply isn't. The gentleman is distinguished, important, wealthy, wielding both prominent power and position. Yet despite wielding such tremendous power, the gentleman still notably shares Henrik's sensitivity towards rejection, embodying his worst qualities in regards to it. The final thing that strikes me about the gentleman is how rapidly he turns, with Henrik having the ability to fully moonscorch within the first day of the festival. Henrik as a person expresses relatively extreme paranoia, and has a tendency to self-isolate in times of mental distress. When we encounter him, he's typically roaming the halls all alone, which to me also seems to suggest the gentleman is born from a deep loneliness. Then we've Salmarie, who, of the three, by far embraces her new form the most eagerly. In spite of how physically marred her new form is, Samari perceives herself as radiant and beautiful. It's a form that's slightly more difficult to decipher in that it lacks any distinct resemblance to the person that it is born of, but our biggest hint lies in the name of said form, the dysmorphia. One of Samari's most notable character traits is her incredible self-loathing, with her referring to herself in a derogatory fashion both in body and in mind indicating that she detests herself so openly there is little point in transfiguring her into a form that reflects that self-hatred as there is no hidden truth to it, nothing to be drawn to the surface in the way that other moon-scorched forms are supposed to. Despite any distinct human features being coated in a layer of protective armor or being outright stripped away, Samari appears at her absolute happiest the moment that she transforms, indicating that she loads herself to the point that any alternative form, even a monstrous one, is ideal in comparison to the one that she currently possesses something reflected in the fact that the dysmorphia has Samari's human face stripped back. This likely has to do with the fact that, in-game, Samari is a product of experimentation that has taken an extreme physical toll on her body and has heavily shortened her lifespan. She's horribly skittish on account of having been essentially tortured for the first portion of her life and has a perpetually hunched over a shrunken stance. But where Samari is anxious and neurotic, the dysmorphia is, in her own words, radiant. 
approaching battle confidently and boasting of physical strength she has famously lacked in life. Afterwards, there are those whose moon scorch reflects the way they already believe themselves to be, with that image typically being the product of profound personal trauma. In this category, we have Levi, Marco, and Olivia. In a game where nearly every character has a heart-wrenching story, Levi's is the saddest to me, being seized by the state after the murder of his mother and steady deterioration of his alcoholic father, only to be conscripted at the age of 13 as a child soldier. Although Levi uniquely excels in combat, his peers, who are just as young and childlike as he is, don't, with him witnessing hundreds upon hundreds of needless deaths as the age of conscription is lowered. Levi eventually has the epiphany the youth are perceived as expendable cannon fodder that allow the actual soldiers a shot at surviving, and with each new horror that he witnesses, Levi's belief that his country perceives him and his fellow soldiers as nothing more than bodies to be destroyed and tossed away grows stronger. It's also worth noting that at the time of Termina, Levi is only 18 years old, with this war comprising a solid third of his entire life up until the point he decides to desert, unable to bear the brutality of his superiors and surroundings any longer. There's also the certain irony to Levi's character in that he expresses remarkably little pity towards moon-scorched beings, even making the remark that it would be far easier to simply set the entire town on fire. When in reality, Levi pre-transformation has a remarkable amount in common with them, both being manipulated by higher powers to commit tremendous acts of violence they otherwise never would have. When Levi is moon-scorched, he transforms into a creature that painfully embodies this past, with him morphing into a creature known as the Weeping Scope, a faceless human weapon. Any distinguishing facial features are erased as his head morphs into something resembling the barrel of a gun, representing the way in which Levi feels the military has stripped him of his identity and humanity. Note how absurdly oversized this weapon is in context of the thin, half-curled body lying beneath it, how there is no ability for it to think or communicate in a way that isn't based in violence, and yet despite being designed for violence in every way, the weeping scope is remarkably pathetic. It doesn't even seem as though it wants to be the weapon it was made into, with its hands appearing as though they're attempting to claw the weaponized portion of the face off. Unlike other Moon Scorched, it's not frothing at the mouth in rage or deliriously ranting and raving, it's just crying. When you first encounter the Weeping Scope, it's curled in the fetal position, with even members of your party that have been deeply traumatized by monsters such as this one finding its wheeling heartbreaking. The half-curled posture invokes a sort of childlike helplessness reflecting the pain of a character that never had the opportunity to be anything but a weapon of war and is currently operating under the belief that is all they will ever be. There is this almost comical scene earlier on in game in which Levi makes the remark that it's too late to change his life trajectory now, immediately before revealing he's only 18. But that remark is reflective of how he genuinely perceives himself, as something existing on the margins between a helpless child and mindless soldier, and that perception is reflected in the tragedy of the weeping scope. Marco is yet another character that has been forced into a role they explicitly did not want to assume. Due to his impressive size, commendable strength, and the fact that he and his sister were street urchins, Marco has spent his entire life being propositioned by criminals as a thug for hire. However, Marco has never exhibited a desire to resort to crime or violence, even in desperate circumstances, only resorting to either for the sake of ensuring him and his sister's survival. He gradually starts gravitating towards boxing as a means of getting by without committing any criminal acts, but as he carves out a name for himself, he's tricked into utilizing his skills to kill, with his sister's life being threatened in the event he refused to do so, and in order to escape this environment, has to kill once more. This is an incredibly painful act for Marco to commit, with him wanting nothing more than to distance himself from the brutish and bloodthirsty figure he is associated with, all while constantly having to act in a way that affirms it. Marco's moon-scorched form, then, naturally, is a reflection of the hulking, ravenous beast he believes himself to be. This creature is referred to as the giant. Its entire torso is comprised entirely of eyes and teeth, likely in reference to the fact the only way in which Marco was able to survive was through others ogling his most aggressive, inhumane acts. Every part of the giant's body has been mutated into a weapon, with his hands being reduced to crude hammers, his left hand specifically being locked around someone's throat. The creature is also, like Marco, racked with guilt to the point that its head seems to be splitting apart, only capable of chanting the word guilty over and over again, a harsh condemnation of a man that never had any say in his circumstances. Yet of all the characters in this category, Olivia is the one that explicitly views her moon scorch as a reflection of what she has always been, transforming her into a humanoid known as the Mechanical Dance. The Mechanical Dance has no discernible human features, 
with its biggest and bulkiest portions being reminiscent of the wheelchair Olivia uses to navigate the world, with these qualities suggesting the two have somehow physically fused together during transformation. The mechanical dance also effectively has no limbs, with both arms being encased in metal, relying on a mechanical ventilation system to breathe. Its very ability to live and move about is dependent on a machine, reflecting the way in which Olivia believes the world has perceived her since she became disabled, being dehumanized to the point that she believes she is solely perceived as her disability. Olivia repeatedly expresses resentment in regards to the fact the first thing people typically perceive about her is her wheelchair, feeling as though they reduce her to the tool that she needs to survive rather than as a full human being. It's a reflection of a feeling she has clearly harbored for a significant amount of time, because if you should talk to Olivia post-transformation and ask her what has happened, she'll scream back, Happened? I've been this way forever, and express a considerable degree of anguish over her new form reflecting this state. Lastly, we have the moon scorched whose forms reflect what they fear they will become or what they fear they currently are, but don't necessarily implicate what they believe they are. In this category, we have Dan, Abella, Marina, and Osa. Abella's moon scorch, the Chogner, is particularly difficult to decipher for this reason, as it doesn't appear to share all that much in common with her. There are two distinct features of this form that instantly jump out to most people, the elephantine head and overtly masculine body. The Moonscorch's head and name are an explicit reference to an eldritch being known as the Chogner Fawn, an elephantine humanoid creature with a leech-like trunk tip used to drain blood from its victims, invoking parasitic imagery. Why Abella would perceive herself as potentially being parasitic is uncertain, as she harbors a caressing soul, a quality that automatically makes her more attuned towards others' emotions and needs, and playing as her provides the player one of the easiest possible routes to save everyone. What comes to mind for me is the possibility her desire to help is often at odds with her ability to do so, and that may be why she perceives herself as being akin to a blood-sucking pest. As for the masculine torso, Abella, as a mechanic, has to navigate a primarily male-dominated space. She's notably tomboyish, being among the strongest women we can recruit to our party and being able to handle and wield two-handed weapons with ease. We know that women that occupy these spaces are often stripped of their femininity and forcibly masculinized, but there isn't any dialogue that seems to suggest Abella harbors insecurities regarding her femininity, suggesting this seems to be a repressed fear more than anything. These two combinations, the fear of being overtly brutish and masculine combined with the fear of being parasitically destructive, seem to suggest Abella perceives herself as this sort of elephant in a china shop, somebody that inadvertently destroys everything they touch. An especially heartbreaking conclusion for a person so preoccupied with doing good in every move they make. Marna and Osa's forms, on the other hand, share noticeable parallels, each reflecting a fear of being overtly controlled and that their actions are not entirely their own. Starting with Marna, if we take a look at her history, we learn that her father was the head dark priest at the Church of Almer, this role traditionally being one passed on to sons. However, the priests are far from benevolent figureheads, inflicting abominable, immense cruelties upon the vulnerable in the name of their god. Marna's mother is not only aware of this, but is also keenly attuned to the fact that should her child be a son, their entire life would be comprised of cruel, grueling rituals. So in order to prevent Marna from inheriting this fate upon her birth, she is disguised as and raised as a woman. Yet in spite of avoiding this fate, Marna's moon-scorched form, the cocoon, seems to reflect a fear that her destiny and life are still not fully her own. In it, Marna has been reduced to a host being puppeted by a parasitic cocoon we later learn contains the corpse of her deceased father, there even being a leash ensnared around her neck that tethers her to this. Her mobility is heavily reduced in this state, with her being forced to crawl along the ground in a manner we'd associate with an insect. There are numerous layers to this transformation. The first one that jumps out at me being the fact that the cocoon has a distinctly phallic shape and quite literally sprouts from between Marana's legs. Her former head takes the place where her genitalia would have been. This reversal of positions is something that makes a symbol representing Marana's birth sex and the role associated with it what many would consider to be a defining feature. The placement of the cocoon and the fact that cocoon controls Marana's each and every move despite the fact that she's the one that grows it also seeming to suggest Marana fears she is gestating something evil within her likely on account of her Dark Priest heritage. It's worth noting that while Dark Priests in-game are more often than not incredibly violent, Marana isn't. She'll defend herself should the need arise, but she doesn't like doing something as small as holding a gun, viewing them as clunky, awkward burdens only useful for an act she has no interest in engaging in, taking lives. 
So when she's moon scorched, Marana will express an extreme degree of clarity and anguish in regards to the fact that Cocoon is forcing her to do just that. It reflects an incredibly deeply ingrained fear that all she is is the product of her violent history, that all she can hope to inherit is that legacy. Osa's moon scorch reflects fears of having a similar lack of agency. In Osa's instance, Osa is near immediately established to us as a character that values their personal freedom above all else. Yet despite being highly ambitious and seeking to exert control over others, Osa is paralyzed by the fear that his decisions may not be entirely his. His entire life has been shaped by his attempts to avoid becoming another's pawn, to the point that he seeks to harness the power of literal gods, despite the fear that all he is is a toy to an ancient deity he can't fully comprehend. Even when transforming, Osa appears to attempt to take control over the situation, attempting to enter a calm, meditative state in a position where doing so will make virtually no difference in regards to what inevitably will happen. While Osa's moon scorch heavily resembles him in terms of its body and clothing, his entire head appears to have been overtaken by a massive fungus-like growth. And when it comes to large fungus-like growths, the image that immediately springs to mind to people is the image of the cordyceps fungus which renders the insects that infects hapless zombies incapable of controlling their movement. To Osa, this is the ultimate reflection of what he fears the worth of his life will be reduced to in the event his worst fears are recognized, with it being equivalent to that of a hapless insect. And finally, Dan's. Of all the moon-scorched forms we've discussed thus far, Dan's is particularly difficult because it's not so much transformation as it is possession. When Moon Scorched, instead of transforming into a monster tailor-made to fit him as an individual, Dan transforms into a monster already well-established within the Fear and Hunger universe, the Pocket Cat. The Pocket Cat is a servant of the Moon God Rare, with a personality and mannerisms that seemingly transcend the ages. Rather than reflect the qualities of the individual that it possesses, the Pocket Cat seemingly overrides them completely, a tendency we see reflected within Dan's transformation sequence with the pocket cat seemingly bursting out of his body like it's shedding his skin, suggesting a total replacement of the things that Dan was previously composed of. Now, in terms of why the pocket cat has this specific effect on Dan, let's take into consideration both Dan's history and soul type. Dan is a blank soul that has spent his entire life being tormented by people determined to adhere to the will of the old gods, whether those people are cultists sacrificing his loved ones in arcane rituals, or family members that neglect and abuse him to adhere to their god's desires, regardless of how corrupt and cruel they may be. So there is this twisted irony in Pocket Cat, a servant of an old god, seeking to possess a person that has been victimized by them at every turn. The Pocket Cat's actions seem to suggest this is therefore an entity that seeks out people that have experienced immense tragedy to the point they feel they risk being entirely consumed by them with the pocket cat specifically approaching Dan in a moment of profound, immense pain to convince him that his suffering is borderline inevitable. It seems the pocket cat is a being that operates almost parasitically, triggering and feeding off of people's greatest sorrows to the point that nothing remains. The pocket cat doesn't just override the qualities that Dan previously possessed, though. He inverts them. For instance, in battle, Dan has a move entitled Loving Whispers, in which he can sacrifice a portion of his sanity in order to restore your party member's health. In contrast, the pocket cat has a move entitled Chilling Whispers, in which he says something so demented and terrible it freezes you in place, transforming Dan from a person that inflicts harm upon themselves for the sake of others to someone that actively perpetuates that harm, perhaps reflecting a fear of being consumed by one's pain to the point you are reduced to a form that deflects it. So when it comes to crafting motives for death games, while you can resort to the more traditional paths of offering unfathomable riches or threatening the participant's friends and family, I personally find the act of transforming the contestants into amalgamations of their worst qualities or perceived worst qualities and pitting those against each other infinitely more engaging. I hope you enjoyed pouring over every form as much as I did. Till next time. Thank you all for delving into the dungeons with us, and if you enjoyed, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And here's an extra special thank you to our Patreons. What we do would not be possible without your support. If you would like to consider becoming one of them, the link is in the description. Thank you all for your time, and have a fabulous day.